Mrs. McIntyre and follow her. Don't forget, Kids Club doesn't start this Tuesday night. It's next Tuesday night, the 10th, September 10th then. While the boys and girls are <coughs> leaving, I again want us uh, to encourage you to be praying for people who have been affected by Hurricane um, Dorian and, and those who may be in the future. It's interesting, I was thinking while I was sitting there of the different attitudes that people can have uh, during times like this. Um, Dave said something in Sunday school that sort of sparked this. I remember when I was at Florida Bible College, which was right on Hollywood Beach. I mean, there weren't too many uh, Bible colleges that had the location that Florida Bible College had. We were right on Hollywood Beach. You looked out the back windows, and there was the beach. You saw the sunrise over the ocean every morning. But when we had storms, one year I was there, there was a storm that hit that area. And it was interesting because everybody else was concerned about, you know, packing up their things, getting home, and sort of protecting your possessions and your family, being with your family at least during that time, except for one group of people, the surfers. Man, the surfers, it was surf up, buddy, you know, it was time. Grab that surfboard, and it didn't matter what the beach patrol or anybody else said. This was, woohoo, you know, the, the time to go surfing. It was a whole different outlook. And I thought, you know, really, shouldn't we sort of have that outlook? You know, we hang on to our possessions so tightly. And the bottom line is we're going to lose them someday anyways, e either by death or taxes, one or the other, right? <laughs> <What's> the, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I watched a, a video on the current economic situation of America, and uh, basically it, it talked about the tax train coming. So I, I came up with this little thing, that the gravy train is leaving and the tax train is coming. And it has to. Something has to happen. We're $21 trillion in debt now. The economist on this video mentioned the fact that our, currently we spend almost equivalent to what we spend on the military. The entire U.S. military budget is now being spent simply to pay the interest on our, on our debt, on that $21 trillion worth of debt. It's staggering. It's absolutely staggering. Something has to happen. You can cut spending and that won't solve the problem. You can raise taxes and that won't solve the problem. They're going to have to cut ta or raise taxes drastically and cut spending drastically, which means we, we won't enjoy the same kind of lifestyle that Americans have enjoyed uh, for some time now. And it's, getting, it gets, get, it's to that point, actually. It's not really getting that. It's to that point where it has to happen almost, unless there's some sort of miracle that changes things. And, and so, you know, we're hanging on, right? We're hanging on to things as tightly as we can hang on to things. But the bottom line is, one way or another, we're going to lose them. And so maybe we ought to just give them up to God now and, and just live life with the attitude that if I lose everything that I got, as long as I have Jesus, I've got everything I need. And uh, so let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer, though, and pray for uh, the people that may uh, have already been victims of the hurricane and those who possibly might be. <clears throat> Uh, Father in heaven, as Sean prayed earlier, we, we pray that this storm would turn to the north and then to the east and simply go back out into the Atlantic and die there. Uh, that would, it wouldn't cause any more problems for any more people. Uh, and yet we, we know that you may have other plans. That's, that's our desire. That's our wish. That's our prayer. We, we pray together for that. Uh, Father, we pray for those people in the Bahamas even now who are, are being slammed with this storm. We pray that you would... Uh, uh, help them to turn to you. May this be that which causes them to realize that the things in life can be taken away so quickly and so easily. And what's really, really important is our relationship with you, our right standing with you. To help those who don't know Jesus to come to know Jesus, maybe through this catastrophe. And help those who do to, to take a stand for you, to be a good witness for you, to be a help to those around them. We pray, Lord, um, for any other uh, potential victims that may be in the path that the storm takes. We pray, Lord, that, that uh, you would just be with them and, again, help them uh, to have the same kind of attitude that we just prayed for those in the Bahamas. Help us, Lord, to realize that uh, it may not be this storm. It may be another storm or it may be illness. It may be the loss of a job. It may, 
uh, maybe death itself that separates us from those things that we work so hard for and hang on so tightly to. Uh, help us uh, to give those things up to you. To live life realizing that uh, that's not what's important in life. You're what's important in life. And may we seek to live for you with all our strength and with all our energy. We ask for your help in remembering these things as we go about life. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, today is Labor Day. Labor Day is one of those interesting holidays. It's not a religious holiday in nature. It's actually a holiday that was established to celebrate the contribution of workers. The contribution of workers. Work, workers are ac absolutely essential uh, to any society, to any community, to any country. And what's unique as Christian workers, when we think about it, is that as Christian workers, our work is a way that we can bring glory to God. We can actually glorify God by the way that we work. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The way that you work at work, the type of person that you are at work, the productivity you have at work, the honesty that you show at work, all of those things are way of bringing glory uh, to God. And so what is, it's a unique thing to think about the fact that work, work can be that which glorifies God. In fact, I think it was the, that, that work ethic, that Christian, or some people call it the Puritan work ethic, the idea that my work can be a way to glorify God is what helped to make America great, uh, the, the productivity. Because when people went to work, they realized, I've got to work my hardest uh, because I want to honor God in the way that I work. I, I don't go to work to see how little I can do and how much I can get away with, right? <laughs> so some people do. But we go to work to see how hard we can work and how good we can work in an effort uh, to bring glory to God. And so this weekend, being Labor Day weekend, I would like to talk about, and in the providence of God, I didn't have to select a different passage of Scripture. In the providence of God, we came upon a passage, or we are there at a passage in our working our way through the book of Acts, in our study of the book of Acts, we are at a passage that talks about a different kind of work, the work that God has set before us, the work of bringing in the harvest, the harvest of souls. In Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, it says this, after, the, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves." And so he says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. And Jesus is saying, hey, you pray, pray for workers. And the obvious hopes, I think, the obvious, obvious implications, if you will, of Jesus' request to his disciples is that, is that they'll recognize that they're to go. In fact, he goes on after he just says this, pray that the, or ask that the Lord of the harvest, therefore, will send out workers into his field. He says, go, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. We know that just before his ascension into heaven, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Making disciples, not just professors, not just converts, but making disciples, people who will obey all things. Remember, he said, teaching them to obey all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so we have a job to do that is of eternal importance, that is more virtuous, more noble, and more lasting than any other job here on earth. And that is the job of fulfilling the Lord's will in our life and helping people to come to know Jesus Christ. And we see an example of that in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. We left off with verse 25 <clears throat> last week. and uh, Well, not last week because uh, Brother Dave preached last week, the week before that. Uh, this morning, though, we'll be picking up where we left off with verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, 
an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived from justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Father in heaven, again, we, we pray that you would just guide us and uh, convict us of how we might apply the truth of this passage uh, to our lives in the century in which we live. Uh, help us help us to be better workers in your field. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've come up with four different principles from this passage that will help us in our effort to make witnessing a part of our lifestyle. Oftentimes we think of witnessing or evangelism as a program. Witnessing and evangelism are not a program. I understand a church can have a program that has with its purpose witnessing or evangelism. But witnessing and evangelism as we see it in the New Testament is a part of one's lifestyle, a part of one's Christian life. It's, it's not a particular program that they joined or where they went you know, to six or seven or eight weeks of classes and learned how to present the gospel clearly. Now I'm not saying those things are bad. Those things are good. Those things are helpful. But if we, if we, in our minds, begin to think of evangelism as just a program, then oftentimes, if that program isn't going on at that time, we just sort of forget about witnessing. And, and I would like to suggest that all of those programs are simply an aid to witnessing, which we ought to be doing all the time. And we see that with the life of Philip. Uh, Philip here goes to this uh, Ethiopian eunuch and joins himself to his chariot for the task of witnessing to him because the, the Lord told him to do so. In fact, if you look, and um, my first point is going to be don't wait for an angel, but here uh, in verse 26 it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down uh, from Jerusalem to Gaza. But this is not the first time that Philip has ever witnessed to anyone. Uh, Philip had been witnessing and Philip will continue to witness in fact, what's interesting, and by the end of this sermon, we'll see later on in the book of Acts, Philip is no longer known as the deacon that was chosen in Acts chapter 26, or in Acts chapter 6. And you may say, well, how do you know he was the deacon that, was, that we read about in Acts chapter 6? Because it tells us later on in the book of Acts that this same individual reading about here in Acts chapter 8 was one of those seven men that was chosen in Acts chapter 6, and we'll also read about him later on in, in the book of Acts as well. Uh, and what we see is that he's living an active lifestyle witnessing. In fact, just look here at the text in verse 40. You can see that he continued to do what he had been doing, telling people about Jesus, in part because these people had lost everything. Do you, do you remember we, we read about the persecution in, in chapter 8? We started off with Saul was ravaging the church of God and everyone except the apostles fled from Jerusalem. And people went and they were scattered and it says that wherever they went, they went about preaching the gospel. Well, guess who one of those people was? Philip. And sometimes when we lose everything, it helps us to do what we ought to do. Sometimes it's the impetus that gets us more involved in that which we should have been doing all along. Uh, 
Philip, I don't know if the, the persecution and the fleeing and the loss of his possessions was that impetus or not. I kind of think he was probably doing what he should have been doing even before that because he was one of the seven that they chose to help wait on the Grecian widows in the early church. But verse 40 tells us that Philip, however, at Azotus, uh, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel. Note this next little phrase, what? In all the towns. And everywhere he went. This guy was telling people about Jesus until he reached Caesarea. And you say, ah, and then he quit, right? Then he, then he decided, well, now it's somebody else's turn. I've done a lot of it, and, you know, I'm getting a little older. And now it's time for the young people to start kicking in, right? It's time for the young people to start doing this stuff. Now, now when, you, when, you, when you read about Philip later on in the book of Acts, he, he's now called Philip the Evangelist. And he was still apparently evangelizing. He had four daughters that were virgins, unmarried and that were known as prophetesses, which tells me he was living for the Lord. Philip was still doing what he should have been doing and what we ought to be doing as well. He was still seeking a harvest for God's glory out of God's field. And, and so my first point again is don't wait for an angel. In this particular case, an angel motivated Philip to go and talk to this Ethiopian eunuch. Now, I think that this was a special case for a special reason. I think it was because this Ethiopian eunuch was going to be the chosen vessel. I cannot prove this because Scripture doesn't take it or tell us about it. We don't know what happened to this Ethiopian eunuch, but we do know that the gospel made it to Ethiopia. We do know that a church started in Ethiopia. History tells us that. In fact, there's an Ethiopian church that is still in existence, Christian church still in existence in Ethiopia, although the geographical boundaries of present-day Ethiopia are different than they were in the biblical times. What we know is there's a Christian church there. In fact, they're the only church that I know of that actually includes the, the what we call pseudepigraphal book of Enoch in their canon of Scripture. But nonetheless, there's a Christian church there. And, and this highway, the other reason why I think that this was a special case where they, it, the angel wanted Philip to go and talk to this specific man at this specific time is because he sends him to this particular highway that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza or Gaza. It's a desert road, and most scholars believe that this road that's being addressed here is what, what is known as the King's Highway. It, it's, a, it's a travel path that early caravans would take from the northern part of Asia Minor down to the northern coast of Africa or to anywhere in between. You see, Israel was str strategically located. If you were to look at a map, it, you'd have up here, you'd have Asia Minor with Turkey and everything way up here, and you'd come down and you'd have what today is called the Middle East, you'd have Israel running along the Mediterranean, and then down here uh, you would have all those southern areas including North Africa. And anybody wanting to trade from the north to the south had to go through where? What was the shortest route? Travel closest to the sea. That was also flat. There were two mountain ranges. There are, <laughs> where there are two mountain ranges in Israel. And, and so you want to take flat land because it's a lot easier to walk on flat land than it is to go up and down hills, especially when you get older. Barb and I go up to the mountains now, we go hiking, and we spend more time resting and catching our breath <laughs> than we do hiking. Uh, so you want flat land. And so they would take this, what was called the King's Highway. It was where these trading caravans would travel along the Mediterranean Sea to get from the northern part of that continent to the southern part or all the way uh, to Africa. And that's what this Ethiopian eunuch is probably doing. He's an important official. He's in charge of all the treasury of Candace. Now, he had come up to Jerusalem with a purpose of worship, which is interesting. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, um, but I think that's where he's traveling, and so uh, this is a perfect spot for one of the, the followers of Jesus to share the gospel with somebody from an international country that could then take the gospel back to that country, and so this, this is strategic, I think. I think that's why there was an angel involved in it, but you don't have to wait for an angel because Jesus has already given you a commission. You say, well, you know, I'll witness when an angel comes and tells me to witness too. <laughs> you know, Jesus has already told you that. And by the way, Jesus is more important than angels, isn't he? Jesus is higher than the angels. He's better than the angels. He's the creator of the angels. And Jesus has already told you to go. Again, in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. As you are going, literally, go is a participle there. Add an ing to it. In the Greek, it's a participle. And so we could say, as you are going, present tense, as you are going into the world, make disciples. 
Okay, baptizing them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Jesus has already said, go and witness. Be a witness. Be a witness. As you are going, be a witness. As you go to work tomorrow, be a witness if you work tomorrow. Some of the school kids are going, woo -hoo. Well, tomorrow's Labor Day. What am I talking about? Tuesday. Tuesday, the school kids are going, woo -hoo. School's been called off already. You know, and so they get an extra day off. So maybe you won't have to go back to work till Wednesday, but when you go back to work, go back to work with the idea of being a witness. On Thursday, with the idea of being a witness. When you go to, uh, uh, if you go to a, a restaurant, go with the idea of being a witness. Wherever you go, as you are going, make the disciples. You don't have to wait for an angel. This is a unique situation here where I think that God is going to use this individual to take the gospel to Ethiopia. Secondly, so first, um, don't wait for an angel. Secondly, be willing to cross boundaries in being a witness. I've talked about this before, but I think we see it quite clearly again here in this particular passage of Scripture. Philip goes to this individual because the Spirit of the Lord is leading him to this individual. Verse 27, so he says, it says, so he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone uh, to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way he was sitting in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah. Now, that, that's not coincidental. The guy's reading from Isaiah uh, chapter 53, where it's talking about Jesus Christ. It's talking about the coming Messiah in Isaiah. It doesn't identify him as Jesus. We all know from our hindsight, looking backwards, that it's talking about Jesus. They did know that it was messianic in nature, though. The Jew Jewish people did. This Ethiopian may not have. But he's reading that very passage in the Old Testament that probably speaks more clearly about Jesus Christ than any other passage in the Old Testament. That's not coincidence that the Spirit of God has him on this highway going back to his country and, and then says to Philip, you go join him. And so God, God directs him there on purpose. But the individual that Philip is going to speak to is quite different than Philip. And, and in a lot of ways, maybe even scary to Philip or, or maybe repulsive to Philip in some ways. And yet Philip, Philip didn't even, it's, there's no mention of that scaring him or stopping him. He just goes and he does what the Lord wants him to do. But I recognize that sometimes we don't. Sometimes we let differences in people stop us. First of all, this guy was an Ethiopian, so he's a foreigner. And, and, but he didn't stop, uh, you know, I don't know, I guess maybe he spoke some Hebrew. I'm not sure exactly how they communicated. It doesn't tell us which language. Maybe they both spent, spoke Greek. Greek was the universal language at this time in history. It was the trade language. It was a lot like English is today. In, in, in my travels around the world, I say around the world, to mainly to Eastern Europe and Western Europe, uh, I run into people almost all the time, unless I'm lost, <laughs> I run into people that speak English. When Barb and I were in Italy, we, uh, we, were, we got lost. We were on the motorcycle. <clears throat> we separated from the German couple that we were with, and I made it back to the hometown. I couldn't make it back to the bed and breakfast. Normally, you could, uh, we could find people in Italy all over the place that spoke English, and that time, everybody I stopped to ask, they didn't speak English, they didn't speak English, they didn't speak English. Finally, finally, a young man who spoke English not only told us how to get back to the bed and breakfast, actually escorted us. He was on a little moped and escorted us all the way back to the bed and breakfast, and then I tried to give him some money for doing that, and he wouldn't take the money. Now, that was really cool. Now, here I'm a foreigner in a different place. He could have been annoyed and say, why don't you learn Italian if you're in Italy, bud, you know? <laughs> and he could have left me there. But he didn't. He, he escorted us right to the bed and breakfast. It was really neat. And sometimes we, sometimes because they're foreigners, we, we, we back off. Whether, whether it's because we're just afraid that we might not be able to communicate properly or, or sometimes maybe because of some sort of dislike. Especially if, they're, if there's something about that country, what if they're, you know, they're t from uh, Iran? How likely are you, you know, if you see somebody um, that looks like a, you know, a Muslim in the airport and you end up sitting next to him, are you inclined to witness to him or are, you or are you inclined to think, I wonder if he's a terrorist? I hope they don't let him on the airplane. I hope he doesn't sit next to me. Yeah, you know, do our fears because of where they're from motivate us to witness to them or cause us not to witness to them? This, this guy was a foreigner. Or what about, what about the current political situation that we have here? People coming in over the border. 
Man, many of them Hispanic, and some people are really mad about the fact that so many illegals are coming over the border. And, and do we, then when we run into somebody that might be in that, that category, uh, do we think, I'm not, you know, go back to Mexico, buddy? Or do we seek to share Christ with them? What's the first thought that comes to your mind? Go back to Mexico or, hey, this person probably needs to know about Jesus. Now, I'm not giving you a political opinion of, of whether I think they ought to stay or not. I think everybody that enters this country ought to do it take the legal process to me that's just the um, we're supposed to obey Roman, Romans 13 obey government right um, but do we still seek to cross that boundary to witness to him also notice he was a eunuch now, for those of you that don't know what a eunuch is a eunuch was someone who was a male who was castrated there were multiple reasons for that uh, sometimes one of the most common reasons was that they were oftentimes put in charge of the king's harem and because he was in charge of the harem, this was a way that, that kings believed that it would help prevent him from having relations with the women. Now, it didn't prevent them from being able to have relations with women, but they hoped that it would decrease that chance. But even if they did, they couldn't have children. They couldn't impregnate the women. Therefore, there would be no half-breed heirs to the throne. It was a way of protecting their own rule. Where if somebody who could, could impregnate a woman was in charge of the harem and did so if it was the queen specifically, then they might have a claim to the throne. So it was really sort of looking out for self. Hey, we'll take these guys, put them in charge of the harem, but in the process they castrated them. Sometimes it was done as a criminal penalty. In fact, this is really interesting. The ancient Assyrians castrated those individuals who were involved in homosexual acts. You say, well, why is that really interesting? Well, let me ask you this. That, were the Assyrians um, believers in Yahweh? Did they follow the Pentateuch? Did they, did they follow the Old Testament scriptures? No. They, they didn't have the law of Moses. Why in the world, then, would the Assyrians, a pagan group of people that wor worship false gods, have prohibitions against homosexuality? Now, I think it's Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, that God has written on the hearts of men his laws, that our conscience bears witness to what is right and what is wrong. Romans 1 and 2 talks about that, that the law of God is written on men's hearts. And that's why you can go almost anywhere in the world at almost any time in the world's history and you'll find common moral principles among peoples of all races, of all ethnicities, all around the world. I know there are a few exceptions, but by and far, by and far, every... Lying is wrong in almost every culture. Stealing is wrong in almost every culture. Marriage uh, is upheld in almost every country, and, and, and uh, adultery is almost forbidden in every country. And, and here what we see is we see the ancient Assyrians would castrate individuals who were involved in homosexual acts. So sometimes it was a criminal penalty. Sometimes it was because they were in charge of the harem. Also what we learn from what history tells us, especially, especially with certain people groups, and which would probably include the Ethiopian here, is that they also, because they were in charge of the harem, they often had the king's ear, right? They, they were in charge of all his wives, and so they had access to him more than the average citizen would. And because they had access to the king, oftentimes they would become almost like advisors to the king. They would rise to positions of authority and power. And that's what we see here. If you look at this again, verse 27, so he started out on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. They also felt that eunuchs would be more loyal to them because they didn't have their own children and they couldn't have their own children. So they didn't have that, that mixed conflict of spending time with my children and being concerned with the affairs of my children versus being, affairs, being concerned with the affairs of state. So there were multiple reasons uh, as to why one was castrated and why one could become uh, a position in, or enter into a position of influence. Also, there's another reason that I didn't mention. In, in some, some pagan religions, the priests were castrated. And that uh, was a part of the ritual of becoming a priest in some pagan religions. And so with that, though, came, it was pretty much commonly held among the Assyrians, the Chinese, um, uh, even in places like Singapore and Vietnam, what, did, what is now modern-day Singapore and Vietnam. In their ancient days, they, they practiced the same thing. 
But it was pretty much common among all those people groups that eunuchs were looked down on as not being completely whole. They weren't really men. Today we might, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, they're girly men, right? Girly men. That's, okay. <laughs> My best imitation. I don't, so, but, you know, they looked at them as, a, okay, they're not really whole. Or something like, even if they enjoyed a position of influence, even if people were afraid of them because they had the king's ear, they still weren't seen as, oh, they're not real men. They don't have all their parts. And, and so they were actually looked down upon a little bit. In fact, now this is for a different reason, but even, did you know even the scriptures prohibit, the scriptures prohibit a eunuch from entering into the Jewish temple, into the sanctuary. Let me read to you from Deuteronomy <clears throat> Chapter 23, verse 1. It says, No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No one. Now, this is interesting because what does it tell us that this Ethiopian was in Jerusalem for? To worship. But you know what? He wasn't even allowed in the sanctuary. He wasn't allowed in the temple. That's like somebody coming to church at Grace Bible Church and we would stand up, wait a second, bud, you've got to stand out in the parking lot. You're not allowed in here. You're not whole. And you, so you stand out in the parking lot. Now, we know the reason for this was not because God looked down on this particular thing in, in, in that way, it, it's, but it's because the sanctuary typified something. And it typified the holiness of God and it typified the articles in there typified Jesus Christ and they were, there was a picture of something and there, so there's a, there's a different reason for all of that which we could spend a lot of time on but we're not going to but the bottom line is the Jewish people of Jesus' day would have looked down on this guy as not being whole and he wouldn't have even been allowed to worship but he was there worshiping that's why I said this was not by chance this was God directing all of this and, and so it's a unique situation. Don't wait for an angel to tell you to go. God has told you to go. And cross those boundaries. Be willing to cross those boundaries. In fact, God has something really good planned for everybody in the future that started with the Messiah and actually is in effect now, I believe. Because part of the promises of the Old Testament concerning the Messianic kingdom were initiated with Jesus at the cross. Now you say, how do you know that? Remember, remember when at the day of Pentecost? Uh, when, every, when the Holy Spirit descended on the believers there and they all spoke in tongues. Do you remember what they quoted, what the apostles said? But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he quotes from Joel chapter 2. And, and in Joel chapter 2, if you go back and read it, it talks about the sun, uh, the sun turning dark and, and astronomical signs and all sorts of phenomena that didn't happen on the day of Pentecost but will happen. But what that tells us is that the, the, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, initiated this age. And many of the promises concerning the, 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 what we would say were for the millennium actually are more for the, mes, the, the messianic age than just for the millennium. And, and so even what I'm going to read here now, um, which is, would apply to this eunuch. In Isaiah 56, another Old Testament passage, it says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say... The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. To them I will give my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. You see, what, what the scripture is saying is God has these beautiful promises for everybody regardless of their physical condition, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their social status, regardless of their wealth, regardless of those who, who obey the Lord will be honored by the Lord. doesn't matter where you come from or what your past is or anything else about you. you those who honor the Lord will be honored by the Lord. Verse 6 goes on to say, this is again from Isaiah 56. Verse 6, also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. So he's not just the God of the Jews. Even the foreigners. Verse 7, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Where have you read that before? 
Who said that? In the New Testament, right? Jesus said that. That's why I say this is true now. This isn't just true. Parts of it are true, and there only be par parts of it will only be true in the millennial kingdom. But parts of it are true now. God honors those who honor Him. And it doesn't matter what's happened to you, what you are like, what your past is like, where you come from, uh, anything about you. God simply looks at the heart of men now. Uh, when we choose to honor God, God chooses to honor us. But... Nonetheless, this was a boundary for Jews of Jesus' day. This was something where you, Philip, when he, you know, he might have been a little shocked. You know, I, we don't have any conversation going on, but you know, Lord, you sure you want me to witness to this guy? He's from Ethiopia. Now, he's a eunuch. He's a bigwig. If I say the wrong thing, maybe, you know, maybe he'll have his men kill me or something. Who knows what fears could have prevented him from doing what God was directing him to do. But the bottom line is he did what God was directing him to do. And so be willing to cross those boundaries that may hinder you. Now, when God moves you to witness to somebody, don't just look at the outside of that person and make a judgment based on the, the outside that, that keeps you from being a witness to them. Thirdly, obey the Spirit's promptings. In verse 29, we, it, now, it doesn't say now an angel said, it simply says the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the, men read, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. Every believer in Jesus Christ now has the Spirit of God indwelling them. I realize that in the book of Acts, and I've mentioned this before, there's a transition that takes place. People receive the Holy Spirit at different times and in different ways in the book of Acts because we have a change in the ministry of the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Jesus even indicated that when he said, when I go, I'll send another, the Comforter. He will come with and abide with you forever. But the Spirit's indwelling occurred in different ways throughout the book of Acts. Don't base your doctrine on the Holy Spirit from the book of Acts. In fact, be careful basing any doctrine on the book of Acts. It's a narrative. It's a history of the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The epistles help us to better understand what transpired. And so I, I would recommend that you go to the epistles if you're, if you're trying to formulate any particular doctrinal belief. But we do, we do know that now from the epistles that every person who believes on Jesus has the Holy Spirit's indwelling. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you have the Spirit of Christ, you are a believer. If you don't, you're not. There's, there's no such thing now as coming to know Jesus as your Savior and waiting for the subsequent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Even though that happened in some places in Acts, it doesn't happen that way anymore. Now you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and boom, the Holy Spirit comes in you and indwells you permanently. In fact, the, the New Testament epistles say that he's our earnest down payment. He's the guarantee of our salvation. And because we have the Holy Spirit of God, oftentimes the Holy Spirit of God prompts us to do things. Now, I'm not saying that you'll hear a clear voice in your head like the Holy Spirit speaking, although I've heard people say that they have, and I've had some situations where it's almost like that. But I think it, I, I like to express it better as promptings, where, where maybe you're sitting next to somebody on a train or an airplane or, you know, in a restaurant, and, and there's this nagging compulsion that, talk to that man. You need to tell, that, uh, talk to that guy about Jesus. And you have two choices at that time, right? One is to obey those promptings. The other is to not obey those promptings, to, to, to grieve the Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 36 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Philip did not grieve the Holy Spirit. Philip did exactly as the Spirit prompted him. And it's just remarkable how God had already been preparing the soil to be fertile for him to talk to him. The Ethiopian believes, and then he even says, hey, what hinders me from being baptized? I mean, how many people come to Christ and ask that, right? Hey, I believe now, what stops me from being baptized? I mean, he was ready. Boom. And he understood baptism probably better than most people understand baptism today. Today, people have all sorts of confusing ideas about baptism. But I'm going to guess this guy understood that it was identification with Jesus, that it was a public testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. And so he says, what hinders me? 
from being baptized. But listen to the Spirit's promptings. When you feel the Holy Spirit nagging you to do something, do it. And, and you'll know whether it's the Holy Spirit or not, because if it goes against Scripture, I can guarantee you it's not of the Holy Spirit. You know? If, if anything that goes against Scripture, it's not of the Holy Spirit. But if it goes along with Scripture, that's just confirmation that it's probably the Lord trying to get you to do something. Fourthly, be intentional. Be intentional missionally. In verse 40, it says, Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. You'll note that it doesn't say that the Spirit of God moved him to do that or that, you know, in every situation, uh, uh, an angel appeared to Philip to get him to witness. No, it just, he went uh, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Now, Caesarea is where he settled down. And you may think, well, was he still preaching the gospel then? Yeah, Acts chapter 21, verse 8 through verse 20 tells us, and this is some years later, this is several years later, Philip is now married and has daughters that apparently are of marrying age. Now, that could have been young in biblical times, but they're of marrying age, yet none of them are married. They appear to be virgins, and they are prophetesses, which tells me that Philip, from everything we can deduce from that, Philip was living for the Lord. And what's interesting is that in Acts chapter 21, he is now called Philip the Evangelist. Not Philip the deacon, but Philip the Evangelist. You see, evangelism was a way of life for Philip. It wasn't a church program. In fact, the church had been scattered. There were no buildings. There were no programs. The believers left in Acts chapter 8 because Saul was persecuting the church. And it tells us that the believers scattered. They took off all but the apostles who stayed in Jerusalem to take care of the church there. There was no church building. There was no church program. It wasn't a necessarily an organized effort. It was sort of an informal. Now, it became sort of informally organized. But the bottom line was it was a lifestyle. They adopted the Great Commission as being applicable to themselves, and they went out and they sought to make disciples. And my encouragement to you today is to be the same way. As you go through life, one of the things that ought to always be crossing our mind is, who can I talk to about Jesus today? Who can I talk to about Jesus today? That ought to be a regular, daily part of our thinking. And then I'd like to encourage you to be intentional about how you do that. Whether it's baking cookies, one of the simple things we do in our neighborhood is barb. I say, I say simple because I watch her do it. <laughs> you know, barb makes a whole bunch of cookies. And then she puts them on trays and decorates them and wraps them with cellophane and puts bows on them and, and we put a little Christmas track. And every Christmas now for the last several years, we go and we knock on Christmas Day on all of our neighbors' doors and we hand them a plate of cookies. And what's interesting is some of those people, they, they, oh yeah, yeah, you gave us a plate last year. Yeah, they were really good. And every, nobody has said, ah, get away, I don't want your rotten cookies. It's just a nice way to do it. Uh, uh, talking to people, there's, there's a guy that um, in our neighborhood and um, he, he asks me for money every time he goes by. He has no legs. He has a rare genetic condition which has resulted in blood clots and both of his legs have been amputated. And he comes by and asks for money. And uh, there's been times when I've hidden from him. <laughs> a, I'll be out in the garage. I see him coming. I'm a cheapskate. What can I say? You know, <laughs> Uh-oh. I'll hide somewhere. And my wife says, why don't you use it as an opportunity to witness? Which the Holy Spirit had already been nagging at me for that because I knew that. And, and so I, I thought, okay, next time he comes, that's what I'm going to do. And I thought, well, how can I do that? I'm trying to be intentional. How can I get him to stay around long enough to talk with me? And so I, thought, so I took some sodas out with me. He came, he came by and asked if I had a couple dollars that I could spare. I said, sure, I'll be right out. I went in, I got a couple dollars out of my wallet, grabbed a Pepsi and a Mountain Dew. I figured he'd like one or the other. Went out and I, I said, what do you like better? He said, I'll take the Pepsi. And I got to talk to him about the Lord Jesus Christ. This was just a few weeks ago. I'm hoping to get to talk to him some more. But it's being intentional. He's coming around the neighborhood, visiting his dad, lives in the house behind us, wheels his wheelchair through the neighborhood every day. Yeah, well, why didn't I do that earlier? Fear of giving away my money. <laughs> well, cheap, cheap. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> cheap, cheap. I'm like a little birdie. Cheap, cheap, cheap. <laughs> and I, being intentional. So what is it with you? What is it with all of us? Who is it that you can witness to? Who do you run into? Maybe it's a relative that you, you think, you know, I should send them a letter. 
Maybe they live up north somewhere and you don't have any kind of... You say, maybe I should send them a letter. Make it a nice letter. Put a track in with it. Give them a phone call. Maybe, maybe it's one of your neighbors. Maybe it's a neighbor you haven't met. Go knock on their door. Say, hey, I live down the street. Just wanted to get to meet you. And maybe, maybe it's that you're not going to witness to them the very first time. Maybe it's that you're going to try to make friends with them and invite them over some night for ice cream. Or, or, or just when you see them walking around the block, talk to them again about Jesus. Being intentional. Are we intentional? Are we like Philip who went around to all of the towns that he traveled to until he made his way to Caesarea preaching the gospel? But even there, still doing the same thing. Or he wouldn't have been called Philip the evangelist in Acts 21. So don't wait for an angel to move you. Cross the boundaries that hinder you from sharing the gospel. Obey the Spirit's promptings. And fourthly, be intentional and missional. Let's pray. Oh, Father in, heart, in heaven, as we prepare our hearts <clears throat> for communion, we know all these things. We